Um, my first uh, speaker is Nathan Meehan. Uh, uh, Dr. Nathan Meehan, he's a senior executive advisor to Baker Hughes. He's previously the founder of CMG Petroleum Consulting, uh, vice president of engineering for Occidental Petroleum, and general manager, exploration and production uh, for Union Pacific Resources. He holds a, a bachelor of science in physics from Georgia Tech and a Master of Science in Petroleum Engineering from the University of Oklahoma and a PhD in Petroleum Engineering from Stanford University. He has published scores of papers, three books, is a member of the Interstate Oil and Gas Compact Commission and serves on the advisory boards of Petroleum Engineering Departments of Penn State. Uh, the <laughs> Uh, he's a great guy. Okay, he's a great guy and done incredible things. He's a member of the uh, Society of Eng uh, Professional Engineers in four states. So with that, welcome. Well, I appreciate that. It's really quite an honor for me to be here. Uh, I, have, uh, I never knew this organization existed until Steve invited me to come speak here. I'm very impressed with what I've learned so far. Um, I want to talk to you about hydraulic fracturing. My, my license plate says frac job. And I got a customized Texas one. I applied for it. I got a new car. And they turned me down the first time under the reason that that was an obscenity. I had to actually appeal to get frac job as my license plate. So uh, clearly there's some social issues associated with hydraulic fracturing, but I want to make a case for that its importance in terms of uh, the sustainability and the environment. Uh, but I want to start here. This is the 1958 de Havilland Comet, the first commercial jetliner. It's powered by four ghost engines. Now, we have aerospace guys here who probably know that what 15,000 pounds of thrust means, and I, it's not a unit that's, that's helpful to me, but I understand it's the, these engines were uh, that scale. Now, today's uh, commercial jets, this is uh, quite a bit more power. But the most important thing is their reliability. This is a map of where I've traveled in the last two years as president of the Society of Petroleum Engineers. Ellen, this is the distance to the moon and back. So if you need any help, I'm, I'm certainly capable of doing it, although I tend to stretch it out over a lot longer time. If I had been flying in the 1958 uh, vintage uh, engines, I would have expected four to eight mid-air engine failures during this time. Whereas with modern technology, I could expect to keep up my current pace for another 40 years and not ex encounter such a failure. So it's not only the capabilities, but the reliability that has improved dramatically. And that's important to a lot of us, uh, me particularly. Uh, here's a similar piece of technology that's improved quite a bit uh, over the last few decades. I got one of these put in just a couple of months ago. So I'm also very interested in improved capabilities and reliability. We've done that in a number of areas in the oil and gas industry and advanced that here on the top left, you see something that's a nanotechnology device. It, it, they're gigantic and they weigh hundreds of pounds, but instead of conventional metals, they're made from metallic dust with each particle coated with nanomaterials, and the resulting product is lighter than aluminum but stronger than steel, and then is capable of dissolving, essentially, on command when we contact it with a certain type of fluid. So we're hiring quantum physicists into the oil and gas service sector, and that's one of the things where pumps and pipes and the kind of data exchanges we've heard about earlier are very important and critical to our company. Now, uh, we've heard about shale stuff. Uh, when I started drilling horizontal wells in the late 1980s, and today the vast majority of onshore wells are horizontal wells. The uh, hydraulic fracturing, pumping high rates of 
uh, liquid, typically with some sort of uh, polymer in them, either uh, small concentrations of polymer as we do in slick water fracturing or very large concentrations of cross-link polymers that make quite a viscous fluid and are able to carry eight, 10 pounds per gallon of sand. But typically the, the modern types of frac jobs are less viscous fluids with lower concentrations of sand. But multiple stages, sometimes 40 and 50 of these frac jobs in each of the horizontal wells is what is driving the shale revolution today. Uh, this is a large scale industrial activity. The wells are relatively closely spaced. And in some places they're close to people's houses. And so to put all of the sand and all of the fluids that are required, there's a lot of trucks, there's a lot of noise, there's a lot of potential to spill things. And so there are challenges that we face in the unconventional world to be sustainable and to be able to be good neighbors and to maintain that social license. But none of us understood or expected the scale of public, public opposition to fracking. Fracking is this swear word. And you know, we, we, we just hate that word, you know, to see it with a K. I don't know, it just, it's, it's horrible for oil and gas people because we've been doing hydraulic fracturing since the 1950s. In 1975, I got my first job in the oil business and the first thing I did was go out on a frac job. And so we've been doing it for years and years and it's been, as far as we can tell, safe and, uh, you know, very little damage. Uh, but now, of course, with Gasland, the movie, and the entire world, as I go around the world, I see this opposition to fracking that's just virulent. Uh, put a little context in here. This is the Baker Hughes rig count since 1949. The peak over here is a roughly when I was born. This first trough over here was roughly when I got my first car. During that whole time period, two to three dollar oil and uh, rig activity dropped dramatically. It has gone up and down uh, since then. This is, this is again North America. And these are all rotary rigs, which are the modern types of rigs that you see everywhere. Uh, cable tool rigs, if we counted those, uh, we would actually be at a lower rig count today than we have been since Abraham Lincoln was president of the United States. But I want to look at the, these little dips that have occurred these last few times. When people talk about the cyclic nature of the oil and gas industry, they're probably talking about this kind of thing. If we take the peak uh, drilling activity just before that dip and normalize that to one, then you can kind of see what those recoveries have typically been. Within a couple of years, we were normally back to 80% of where we were drilling before. Uh, within three years, typically recovered. And that's how this current uh, decline started. It uh, didn't continue like that. We are now just, we, if you updated this graph, it went forward uh, flat for quite a while. It is just now beginning to recover. But uh, So we're talking about fracturing and sustainability. To give you context of how much this is loved, as I was walking in Copenhagen, I was approached by the lady from Greenpeace here she came up to me, I was dressed like this, and she said, would you like to donate to Greenpeace to help end our addiction to fossil fuel? And, well, I asked her, well, maybe, what is your boat powered by? And she just turned and walked away, I'm not sure. Uh, if you see on the side of this thing, there was a big sign, and it says, full enough to Eller fracking. I'm afraid there probably are people who speak Danish in this audience. So I'm gonna translate it without asking if there are any. I'm pretty sure this says, aren't you glad we have a safe, reliable technology like fracking? And uh, this, this, <laughs> okay. But even if I'm wrong on my Danish, I'm confident that this symbol means no more vertical wells, let's drill horizontal wells. Okay, so uh, many of you have some device like this, okay? Uh, I won't tell you which school, but it was here in Texas that uh, one of the students pointed out to me that this was a particularly good knife because it could open beer and wine, as, as if they had bought a bottle of wine with a cork in it. But engineers particularly like these kind of knives because they're multiple functions. And we continue to develop technology. And the, the direction of oil and gas technology has been 
adding more and more functional capability and more and more complex things. And surely these things are better as we add more uh, functionality. And, and I, unfortunately, we tend to be headed in this direction. And at the current oil prices, we have got to over, simplify this. And some of your technology is probably headed in these same, same ways. Um, we've just got a nice, very uh, extensive talk about uh, per capita energy consumption and world energy consumption, so I'm going to skip a couple of these slides. But one of the things that the slide that, that we both showed was this measure of the Human Development Index. And what we have to be able to do is provide safe, affordable energy, regardless of the price, because every measure of quality of life, whether it's GDP per capita, access to clean water, uh, literacy rates, uh, electrification, all correlate with energy use. And this measure of uh, human development, I think this is probably the same data that you showed, um, and it is that, that semi-log scale. So even modest increases in quality of life tend to have large increases of energy flow. And we are, we're not sure how big we can, how much we can change this slope. And there is, a, there is an implication that we can change this slope and improve that bang for the buck that we get in terms of our energy. Uh, I'll just give you one example of that. In 2014, the World Health Organization identified air pollution as the number one source of avoidable death. And the majority of that uh, due to household air pollution, which uh, Bill also talked about. More than half of the ch deaths of children ages zero to five globally from pneumonia associated with household air pollution, more than malaria, dysentery, AIDS combined, and uh, roughly three billion people using primitive fuels. One in eight global deaths as a function of air pollution. Uh, the other thing that we've had uh, that's sort of an unsustainable feature is global CO2 emissions. This is a country by country graph. Uh, the only data in here that really needs to be modified at, at COP21, uh, the Chinese identified their data and said that it was probably 17 to 20 percent low, uh, lower than the actual historical figures. If you look, you notice that a long time, of course, the U.S. has been the number one emitter of CO2, but that that has been declining. That has been declining for one technological reason, ascent to first order. Uh, conventional natural gas production has been roughly constant during, this, during that time period. The only thing that increased was natural gas production from unconventional wells as a result of hydraulic fracturing. And that displaced to first order. This all changes due to uh, decreased coal use for uh, electric power generation. And so uh, the only technology that has materially reduced global CO2 emissions is hydraulic fracturing. Now, again, it is easy to point to China, and if you look at the forecast for India, this yellow curve, uh, that, that forecast is gonna go quite a bit higher. It is easier to for, uh, point the finger and say, that's who needs to do these. But, you know, we've, we've all got these cell phones. We've got computers, whatever else. The planet made a decision economically to export high energy intensive manufacturing principally to China. And as a result, and they de depend very much on coal, during this time of the streak upwards, China completed more than one new coal fired power plant per week, 50, over 50 a year. We didn't have a definition today yet of sustainability, and I like the Brundtland Commission de definition. Meeting the needs of today's without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. The definition of sustainability is not abandoning fossil fuels today. Uh, this is the important part that we need to be able to meet today's needs and not put at risk the future. I have a friend, I like, for our purposes, we'll call him the idiot. Uh, he actually is a very dear friend of mine. He calls me much worse. And we don't agree about anything. I mean nothing. And particularly, we don't agree about energy policy. But we had a discussion a couple of years ago, and there was a handful of things that we did agree about. And one was the importance of energy efficiency in terms of the future. Now, 
energy efficiency and conservation decreases primary demand for my products. But I've never met in 40 plus years in the oil industry any oil man who, or woman who wasn't fully in favor of improved efficiency. The next thing was the role of price. Uh, he's a big fan of all the alternative energy solutions. And of course, very low prices for oil and gas hurt every effort there. Uh, he, of course, has the solution to put big taxes on oil and gas and coal as a solution to that. I think, uh, I don't know what the correct driver for increasing prices over time is. But clearly the role of price is that at higher prices we see increased conservation, we see improved technology. We both agree that we need to eliminate methane emissions. There's no reason within our current technology for these to exist. And if we go after the very largest methane emitters, the top 10 or 20% of the methane emitters, we'll get almost all of the methane emissions eliminated. And we're starting to see drones being used to patrol pipelines and producing areas to be able to quickly identify when methane emissions occur. The next one is need to eliminate flaring. We still do way too much flaring on this planet. We're burning the valuable resource that it is natural gas. And uh, it, flaring should be infrequent, brief, and efficient. This is a, uh, when I gave this talk in Russia and Nigeria, they weren't thrilled with this graph. And in Nigeria, the one guy said, yes, but we have decreased it so much over the past 10 years. And that, that is true. But even today, uh, they had some, some alternative energy uses. They wanted to do some wind and electric. And the amount of electricity they could generate from that plan that the government had was less than what they would generate if they just stopped burning the existing flaring. The United States has dropped a little bit over the last year or two. That's primarily because of decreased drilling activity and improved compliance in the Bakken. If you haven't gone and Googled Bakken from space or something, you're going to be quite disappointed to find Denver and Chicago-like si uh, lights coming from North Dakota. Uh, in other areas that we need to do to maintain sustainability is to ensure wellbore integrity. This is an area where, you know, for non-specialists, we put these pipes in the ground and we have to pump cement around them. We have to make sure that the fluids in the individual zones stay where they belong. And the produced oil and gas or water just goes into the pipe and doesn't exit anywhere else. This technology to make sure this happens long term is now being supported by fiber optics, where uh, very, you know, uh, fiber optic cables can be installed alongside, they have internal gratings, and we can detect very tiny either temperature, pressure changes, or even acoustic signals associated with tiny bubbles that might begin leaking. If we're ever going to do uh, uh, carbon sequestration underground, we're, we're, we're only, I'll give you a hint for those of you not in the oil industry, we're really not going to do that unless we can get paid to do it. So this is a carbon price or carbon tax. <laughs> that, that's what's going to have to happen uh, for us to do it on a large scale. We'll do a demonstration, but nobody's going to do it for free. And I'm sure that whoever's paying that is going to require us to prove that the CO2 is staying where it belongs. And so we'll have to do this. This wellbore integrity has got to be flawless, and it also has to be something that we can prove over time. We've talked over about CO2. My, my friend, remember the idiot, he, he says... Natural gas needs to be a bridge fuel to a more sustainable future. And I am convinced that natural gas is part of our very long-term energy supply. And of course, to maintain the social license operate, we've, we've talked about this before, we cannot have any more oil spills. Uh, in hydraulic fracturing, uh, you know, people complain, my wife, when I asked her, what do you think about fracturing? And she says, well, isn't that what causes those earthquakes? Well, the good news is, at least in Oklahoma, where the, some pretty good science has been done, no. The bad news is that the oil and gas industry caused those earthquakes associated with reinjection of water from uh, large-scale 
uh, essentially EOR projects. These were projects where you had about 99% water being produced, 1% oil, and we, you know, we sell pumps, so we sold a lot of pumps to increase that. And we took about, we used to take about one billion barrels of water a year out of Oklahoma. Now it's like two, and that's all being reinjected into a fractured basement rock. And if you saw Superman the movie, you remember Lex Luthor was going to pump the water in and frack California off to the side. Well, a very similar kind of thing happens there. Uh, one of the big advantages we're doing now is pad drilling. We're going to be drilling instead of wells scattered all around. Those of you who've flown around Dallas Fort Worth, you've seen you know, pads of wells that stretch on as far as the eye can see. What we'll see going forward is 20, 40 wells per pad. So it'll be a much larger place. It'll have a lower total impact. We'll be able to reuse low volumes of natural gas, and we'll be able to reuse produced water and flow back water better. And the other thing that we've, we're really pushing for is an improvement in our relationships with, with the regulators. This has been far too adversarial a relationship historically. We need to be applying rational regulations that have the highest impact, sort of 80-20 rule things, and we need to be collaborating. I'm going to tell one last story. It's a true story. As a Stanford student, my favorite professor was a negotiations professor. And he had previously taught at Harvard, and a friend of his had a beautiful home on a lake. And at one point, the weeds and stuff started growing up in this lake. Now, I took this picture myself. This is not his house. But I talked to the lady here, here and she said that when she was young, this was a beautiful lake. And apparently, he got a lake expert when these weeds started growing up. I didn't know there was such a job as lake expert. I wish I had taken that route myself. But the lake expert showed him what was going to happen to his lake, and over a century or whatever, it would turn into a bog, and you probably, people who've lived in the Northeast know more about this than me. But he didn't want that to happen. He got some contractors. Uh, the lake expert says, you need to put half a meter of sand all across the bottom of this lake. And he got the contractors to make the estimates, and they were going to knock down the garage, and build these pulleys and move sand and dump it. It was going to be $850,000. It was beyond his, lake exp uh, his expertise, uh, you know, his budget at least. And so he got my friend, the old professor, the negotiations expert, tried to negotiate a better deal for him. Complete failure. But eventually, a new contractor came along with a new idea. And they said, you know, let's just wait till January when the lake freezes. We'll put half a meter of sand across the ice and wait till summer. <laughs> now, I tell this story because it's true, but also because it's about the oil and gas industry. Now, in my story, it's a parable, and the homeowner is Exxon. It's Shell. It's Anadarko. And they're not trying to save a lake. They're trying to increase production reserves and do so profitably. And the first thing they did when, they, when oil prices collapsed was come to companies like Slumberger and Baker Hughes and the rest of us and, and negotiate better prices. They did a much better job than the homeowner here. But still, it was inadequate. And so the solution, of course, is going to be, have to be improved technologies that will lower oil and gas development prices. And that's why we're reaching out to other industries and looking around to find new ways so that we can sustainably deliver oil and gas production at whatever prices. Because our our real purpose here is to enable safe, affordable energy, which improves people's lives. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? And the good thing about asking me a question is I never say I don't know because I just make stuff up. I might get off easy here. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much.